worst platforms without a doubt are TikTok, Twitter, and then YouTube. Anything where people don't have a face on the other side and they just have these like blank profiles, like they are ruthless. Even if you followed me for years, you probably couldn't tell me what I posted three days ago. Mm. And if you don't like something, we're so quick to just swipe away or move on to the next thing. People aren't sitting there like looking at you, criticizing you, saying how stupid you look like, that they just really don't care. Most people who are doing better than you aren't gonna try and bring you down. What those people are doing is they're projecting their own insecurities or traumas onto you because it's an ego-based thing. If there is any self-doubt or something else, maybe that's something you have to explore, but why should I get upset about something that you say about me? All right, guys, welcome back to the Light It Up podcast. If you're new to the channel and you want to know everything about making money in real estate, selling sales skills, building your business or investing, then subscribe below and tap the bell for notifications so you can be the first to know what makes our great guests so successful. And we get calls and emails every day from people just like you that want to learn more. And we absolutely love it. So if you're a new agent or someone who's just looking to grow their business, give us a call, shoot us a text or write us an email. We're happy to help. All right, guys, let's jump into it here. Alex Dunbar out of Vancouver, Canada. Thanks so much for joining us today, man. Thanks for having me. So we're switching it up a little bit. We're going to have you give a little bit of an intro. Tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you're based, how long you've been in the business and uh, what you're working on these days. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah, so my name is Alex Dunbar. I am a residential realtor out of the greater Vancouver area, more so the suburbs, but I have a business partner who kind of works more so in Vancouver and the closer cities to that. And I'm more Surrey Langley for anybody who may know in uh, British Columbia. This is my fifth year in the business. And part of the reason why I think potentially that I may be on this podcast is because the major source of my business so far has been through social media. So I've also kind of recently dove into trying to help other agents improve their businesses through utilizing video and social media. And yeah, that's kind of where we're at right now. Awesome. Yeah, I'm starting to feel older. I feel like, um, I don't know, we've had a lot of young people on lately who have been like I'm two years in the business, three years in the business, five years in the business. Yeah, it's, it's like good. dog I, years, but real estate years. Yeah, Kiro and I grew up in a world of like outbound prospecting, lock yourself in a room, bang hunt, the phones. Hunt, hunt. Yeah. Cold call, Fizbo's expired, door knock. Um, so I would say just over the last two years or so, have we been, you know, diving deeper into social media and, and trying to immerse ourselves with with people like yourself who are wildly successful on, you know, social platforms. Yeah. So that's absolutely the reason we wanted to have you on today, and uh, we're excited to talk a little bit further about it. Sounds good. But first, uh, the lightning round. The lightning round. So we're going to put you on the spot here. All right, so Alex, let's hit you with some questions unrelated to real estate. Who in your life inspires you to be better? I think my family, just to be able to support them as well as realistically every relationship that I have. I just want to be the best person that I can be. Yeah, and just on that note, it's tough in this business because we're always really or trying to compare ourselves to others, especially in this whole world of social media. But one of the people... Other than that, it's just myself, just because I want to be 1% better every day. And sometimes you just got to put the blinders on and forget about what everyone else is doing, because who cares? Yeah. Yeah. If there's one person in the family that you'd say that pushes you more than anybody else, who would it be? Probably my fiance. Yeah. Just because I want to, you know, provide her and ourselves with an amazing life. So. Sweet. Shout out to your fiance. What's your fiance's name? Uh, Christina. Shout out Christina. What's the best job you ever had? It definitely it has to be this one, working in real estate. Yeah. With, without a doubt, I've done some awful jobs in terms of labor. Tell us more about that. Is, <laughs> I've worked at a sawmill on the green chain, so pulling off massive logs all day for eight hours, which is nonstop. Uh, I, was, I was in really good shape, though. Yeah. And aside from that, the next one would have been concrete demolition. And so working in backyards on hills where machines can't get to jackhammering out the concrete and then, you know, wheeling it up small driveways and hills in order to uh, have the team come in and then pour a fresh slab. So that was that was probably the worst, actually. Yeah. 
We had um, one of our buddies on months ago at this point, Ben Esposito. I think we asked him what his worst job ever was, and he said he worked in like a nuclear power plant. Yeah, like radiation sites and stuff like that. With like a meter that would go off. Did I make it up or I feel like no, he, no, he, he felt like he had some sort of like he'd reaction. Have a suit. No, no, I don't think he had a All reaction. Right. Maybe I added that for fun. Why are you wishing that upon him? No, no, no. <laughs> you know, it's it's funny. I think of Mike Ferry when uh, when you talk about like working outside and, you know, uh, I mean, you were probably working in some cold conditions, but Mike Ferry used to always tell us, he's like, you know, it could be worse. You could be like a roofer in July. You're yeah. a realtor in an air conditioned <laughs> office. Just do what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah, what, no, exactly. Growing up, what thing were you most scared to tell your parents? Ooh, that's a good question. These are things I never really thought about. I'm sure you did some um, dumb shit growing up. When I told my dad I didn't want to go to college, he's like, you are stupid. <laughs> I'm like, what do you, you mean? What? He's like, you are stupid. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> actually, that I, I guess on that note, the was actually when I eventually quit sports. I think just because my parents have put so much time into it and I felt I was so invested and I felt the almost like the need to give back in a sense. So the day that I ended up quitting sports, that was a very difficult conversation just because of the time and money and everything else that was invested into it. But they didn't care. They were just like, you know, do whatever makes you happy. Like we're not the parents that are trying to uh, live vicariously through you and hoping that you go pro and whatever. Like those things would have been fantastic. I had a very short college career. Uh, playing soccer but I just realized that that wasn't getting me any closer to the goals that I actually wanted to achieve in life yeah so I thought it was definitely gonna be a, another hockey player from Canada <laughs> no soccer and baseball are the big ones nice interestingly enough my dad was the one that made me quit sports uh, I know he watches this that's why <laughs> because I'm you that suck. references yeah whatever <laughs> uh, <laughs> He's like, you should want to keep doing this. Probably the best uh, thing he ever did for yeah. you. <laughs> uh, true. What's the last thing you completed on your bucket list? Probably getting engaged, which was in December. I know it's a pretty lame one, but yeah, that was I'm sure Christina doesn't one. think it's lame. It's no, no. no I meant for the, for the show, for the show. <laughs> no, what did, how did you're you propose? Good, did you do something special or was it just a, a private thing? More private, just because of the way that she wanted it. And I knew exactly where she was going to be. And that way there would be, you know, it wouldn't be obvious. Because I think that was a bigger thing. She didn't want this, you know, big thing where there's cameras and like, you know exactly what's going to happen. It was kind of just like, yeah. it's actually her first day that she started teaching and she came home. So I knew, you know, I knew her exact schedule, where she's going to be, everything else. And then, yeah, it was just in our, uh, in our home. Yeah. So nice, man. nothing too crazy. Does she work in real estate too? Oh, you said no. she was a teacher. Teacher. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I I can do that. I, it's funny because I look at that. I'm like, I could not do that. Like working with young children, and I know she feels the exact opposite about what we do. So well, it's sort of like working with children same. when you're a realtor. <laughs> to a certain extent, yeah. <laughs> you're, whether you're it's not the, wrong. whether it's the people on your team or some of these clients, it's a lot of babysitting. But yeah, back to the proposal thing. Yeah, big events isn't good. Wait till the end, and those are the best things to do. Kiro's really good at the proposal part, not so much <clears throat> on the marriage part. Yeah, you know, it is what it is. Uh, you can give out the ring. You just can't really follow through with the... Or get it back. Um, what's, <laughs> <laughs> what's the most surprising self-realization you've had? Actually, it would be that, you know, you can be and do whatever you want. I mean, it sounds very simple, but when I was originally going through university, I didn't even, like, real estate wasn't even a thought in my mind. And I had this little kind of grace period in between trying to go from getting my bachelor's degree to master's and had all these other things, but when you're going through university, you're so like narrowly focused that when you actually expand your horizons and you just kind of realize that there's so many other opportunities out there. And I guess this kind of goes back into how I got into the business, but I always thought, you know, I don't want to be that aggressive, pushy salesman. I don't have the right personality. I'm not outgoing enough. And then through personal development, I realized number one, you don't have to be that sort of salesman, right? Like I'm an educator and a consultant. Sure. And number two is, I can be and do whatever I want, right? Like I'm not stuck in this box. Yeah. So that would be it. Yeah. Perspective is everything and how you approach it. There's like three kinds of agents in this industry. You'll have the one that's going to be, you know, hating the grind and not wanting to do it. But then you'll have another agent that can love the grind, but then gets rejected and they get discouraged very quickly. And then the last person is the one that falls in love with the process and develops those skills over time. So it's finding what fits you and falling in love with that process more than anything else that makes each individual person successful. 
being in the business for the last five years, walk us through your journey, how you got started and where you are now. Yeah, so I originally got my foot in the door because my mom was already in the business and I, she had asked a couple of times. And as I said, I was like, ah, it's not for me. I don't, you know, I can't see myself doing that. And then kind of, as I said, going through that self-growth phase, I realized that this is something that I actually wanted to give a shot. So told her one day, she was obviously over the moon because she always wanted me to partner with her in real estate. So worked with her over at Remax for the last four years, just as a partnership. So that kind of got my foot in the door, which was always a good thing. I always think that it's best for newer agents to be on some sort of a team or have a mentor just to start to see the volume to actually know what you're doing. And then that kind of got my feet on the ground. She was just, you know, your kind of average agent, not necessarily like didn't have a big team or anything else. So it's not like I was handed a bunch of business or anything. It was more so just helping me go through the ropes. Yeah. You just um, call your mom an average agent? I did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being honest. I, I'm with you. <laughs> And and okay, above average, like honestly, above average. But, oh, that's that's um, sweet. <laughs> this is so bad. <laughs> no, you're good, man. John's sense of humor. The only thing in my I'm just mind, trying to get you out of your shell. Yeah. But the only thing in my mind is seeing, like, or imagining you at an inspection, and she's calling you, and you're like, "What? Well, I'm with the clients. <laughs> like, leave me alone. I'm with the clients. I'll call you back." <laughs> no, because I mean, she has like the complete opposite personality as me. Yeah, I'm a little bit more reserved, very analytical. She's what I would almost consider more of your typical real estate agent sure. just like super bubbly like she can walk into a room and just like captivate the whole thing right which is amazing like it's such a good skill to have so we to an extent like obviously we work together but working with family sometimes you can bash heads a little bit and you know i'm kind of on the upward trajectory in my career she's at a place where she's happy doing what she's doing but doesn't sure. necessarily want to grow you know could retire at any time so recently in january we went our separate ways she may still come back later on we'll see but uh I actually moved over to a uh, real broker recently. So that's been a cool experience. And then has, I kind of mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, I have a new business partner that we are kind of taking this thing on together. And yeah, that's kind of where we're at now. Awesome, man. Sweet. That's exciting. So tell us a little bit more about how you got so involved in creating content. Like how did you, you know, for us, like we met actually through the Mike Ferry program, right? At like an event. And we just, I mean, for me, ironically actually, in Vegas, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was sitting next to you and you weren't taking notes. And I was like, dude, this man is telling us what, all we need to do to make money. It was, and you're sitting there just. I have a really good memory, yeah. but I guess I remember it the way I want to. <laughs> so, yeah. so I'm like, you know, but yeah, he was like, you're not taking notes. <laughs> I'm like, hey. He's <laughs> nice literally telling us too. everything we have to do. So anyway, we met at an event like that. And for us, for me, it was just like, hey, who's the most productive, like successful agent in our market? And they were Mike Ferry agents. Yeah. They were pounding the pavement. They were making the calls and it, it cost nothing to do that. So that's how we sort of got into that, that spectrum of, of prospecting. What made you get into like the content creation side? Were you, did you always have an eye, like a love for content creation even before real estate? What made you get into that? So a couple of different things. When I got started, I did all the same things as you guys and just realized how much I hated the, I guess, cold approach, did the door knocking, you know, did all the Facebook leads and calling all those uh, low quality leads, which honestly was a really good experience and it got me really good at talking to people, but I just realized like, this is not what I wanna do for the rest of my career. So through attending different events and everyone's talking about how good video is gonna be and how you need to get on it, I started to initially just produce pieces of content around things that I was learning, right? Because the best way to actually learn something is to be able to teach it, yeah. but I was, Again, at the very beginning, talking about things that weren't necessarily that interesting unless you're actually going through the process. So, you know, property taxes and land transfer taxes and these sorts of things. And so that kind of got me a little more comfortable on camera, but that didn't necessarily reach maybe as wide of an audience. So that was a little over four years ago. And what I started to realize is that I wanted to build a business where people were raising their hands and saying, hey, Alex, we want to work with you versus me constantly having to chase them and essentially make them want to work with me. They were already reaching out and saying, we want to work with you. Like, do you have time? Are you taking on new clients? Like we've been watching you for the last six, 12 months. So once that kind of got started rolling, I just kept going with it because I'm also a bit of 
Well, I'm definitely, I'm an, I'm an introvert that is trying to be extroverted. And most people don't know that until I actually tell them because they're like, oh, you know, you're on video everywhere. We see you all, all the time. But um, that's part of the reason as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's really hard to, um, it, like, one of the things I appreciate is that when John goes through our guests and, like, tries to see who he wants to bring on, he's one looking for, like, authenticity and two, like, value, right? And in terms of, like, your stuff, it looks so authentic. And it's, like, you, it almost seems like you've done it for so, so long. So you definitely are a really good replicator of what works, right? Because some of your stuff, it's like, oh, wow, like, this probably looks like it's been done for a while. Who has inspired you to use certain, like, methods of content? Like, what are you getting that, where are you getting that information from to replicate? That's a good question. One of the guys recently definitely is Neil Dingra. Yeah. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. Uh, big mortgage agent out in the States. But he kind of built a business off of short form Instagram videos. And now he's doing some coaching and things around that. He's just been really pushing the informational side of things. Because I think, you know, you have so many different forms of videos that you can do. And everyone or a lot of people try to fit themselves into a box that maybe they don't fit into. Yeah. So for instance, if you guys know people like Matt Leonetti, who is a hilarious content creator, that's just his style. You don't see him sitting here talking about, uh, I don't know, three tips to yeah. help sell your home for the most amount of money. Cause that's not him. Right. He's, yeah. he's the, the funny guy that, you know, he's got uh, such a big personality. So it's like, you don't have to go that direction. It's just cool to see that people can do it in so many different ways. But yeah, Neil's definitely been a big inspiration as of late and especially just in the, the format that I've been utilizing recently. For someone new who's trying to identify because one thing that's become clear to us as we're you know, speaking to people like yourself, there's different kinds of ways you can approach social media, but you have to figure out which one is the content form that you're most passionate about, right? Whether it's making like, uh, you know, being an educator, edutainment where you're mixing it up a little bit more, uh, somebody who's community oriented, someone who's just like giving facts about like, or I said that one, but someone who's uh, doing like wonky videos or someone who's like making fun of like real estate situations. Yeah, I feel like there's, yeah. There's like a bunch of them, but then how do you identify the one that clicks with you the most? If you're like someone who's newer to the social space. I think you just got to get out there and try things, right? When you get started, I don't think you want to niche down right away, personally. I think you try things, you see what feels best, what's working for you, and then kind of just double down on that. Because you can take all these ideas in and then choose a few different avenues. And I think very quickly, especially the more content that you're putting out, the quicker you're going to get a feeling for what's working, what you kind of align with, and how you want to move forward. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Like, we've talked with so many different people, like Tom's story, right? I mean, based on our conversation with him, he's big on the market updates, right? Yeah. Then you have someone like, like a Katie Day, I think of her doing like a lot of the local businesses. Yeah. Right. She's over at Real Broker as well. Then you think of like a Bethany Nolan. She's more for like the tips and the tricks and the. Yeah. You know. Well, it's more caption oriented yeah. than anything else. And everybody's got their own little niche. But what would you say? Which bucket do you think you fall into? Like, where, what's your specialty? Definitely more informational content. Yeah. And I take a little bit of a different approach on the different platforms. So Tom's story is actually somebody that I've tried to somewhat replicate his business model yeah. to an extent just because, and that's on the YouTube side of things. The sure. only difference being is that I've taken his business model, but applied. I don't know if you guys know Levi Kasich. Yeah. I think I'm saying we just that had right. Him, we just Kasich. had him on yeah. uh, what, two weeks ago. Passive prospecting. Yeah. No, it's a, yes. Kiro read his whole book in like uh, an hour and a half. Yeah. It's filled with freaking information. There's so much you don't yeah. know about it though. That's the problem. And then on top of that, you look up information on YouTube and then you get false information. But yeah, Levi Lasik. Yeah, so essentially his way of going about it and doing more so the community-focused stuff, because I found that to be, personally, it's almost like a tried-and-true model across North America, is that the community-focused stuff is going to drive more clientele from out of the area or sometimes even in the area as well. So that's my direction on YouTube, which I've kind of enjoyed, but then on the other platform that's more informational, educational, factual, just because I am more of a, an analytical person, and it's just crazy to see like those are the types of clients that are reaching out to me just because I've literally had people say, hey, I've heard people say this a hundred times, but the way that you said it just made sense to me. And that is, was like market information? No. Community. Exactly. Market like, well, no, 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 that one, that one is more market information or like even just explaining like investing potentially. Sure. So, But how do you make that stuff interesting? 
you know, and that's like something we talked about with Tom Story a little bit, right? Because, I mean, we all have that agent in our current market or somebody maybe that we've just seen on Instagram or other platforms that come on every week or every month and they say, like, all right. And so in our market this month, we saw 30 homes go under contract and then, you know, uh, four new homes came to the market and our absorption rate, like, how do you make that stuff interesting, like digestible? Like, because if I'm not, even if I am looking for a home, I'm not sure I understand all those terms, like, what do we do to make that actually exciting, digestible, interesting? So a couple different ways. And again, I think it really depends on the platform. So I'm not sure if you guys know, but I almost kind of made a name for myself originally on TikTok, if you can believe that. And the thing with that is I'm very long winded and I had to learn how to condense, you know, five minutes of information down into 30 seconds. And so as you kind of mentioned before is how can I, it has to be entertaining, right? Like people don't want to sit there and hear like listen to you talk about days on market and absorption rates and these sorts of things. So you've got to really think about it in how does the consumer want to consume that information? Like what is actually going to make sense to them? So you really just have to simplify things as much as possible. And so someone who actually does a fantastic job at that is Tom's story because he's able to take these broader, more, you know, technical terms and actually put it into language that makes sense to the consumer. Yeah. And he knows how to, he, he's very well spoken with it. And he knows how to do a very smooth call to action on all his videos too. He, he role played one on a webinar with us and it was just almost like it was perfect. What, what's something that can help? Because when you have like a sales kind of mind, your mind's thinking about like, what's like the point I'm trying to make? I want it to make it a little bit make sense. And it becomes a very long winded thing that you're, you're, you're sharing, what tools or what resources helped you learn how to cut that down? Or did you just do it on your own? I think just through self-learning, looking at other people, having conversations, asking people what they actually care about, right? Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, I think the average consumer doesn't care about necessarily, you know, days on market or unless they're like selling at that very moment. Yeah. Right. It's just how has the market changed month to month, year over year? more generalized. And then if they want to get deeper into that, they can kind of reach out to you. Yeah. I think we personally, I've always been under the impression, like I have to give people all the information right away, like right up front. And that's not necessarily true. You kind of want to give them a few key facts that they're actually caring about. Like, okay, is my house worth more or less than it was last month? Right. Yeah. Are things selling faster or slower? Like, do I really care that it was 12 days versus 17 days? No, probably not. So just simplifying things. That's good. So if we're well, it's, at, it's funny that people even talk about days on market right now. It's like, it's it, well, every market's different too. Like some people are yeah. saturated. Some people have nothing. It's across the board different. The, so ha, have, have in our market, has the average days on market ever fluctuated far off of 30 days? Yeah. For a couple months, 2019, it did right before COVID. Okay. That's when things were dropping down. It's like, oh, market's going to drop. And you're like, yes. Okay. And then all of a sudden shit just hit the fan. And then in uh, the last quarter in the first month of uh, 2023, that's when it was like a lot higher. The one thing is like every entrepreneur has a life cycle, right? Where they go into an industry and they're like, there's a wealth of opportunity here. And then the second cycle they go through and the experience is that there's some challenges here, but they're still optimistic. The third phase is like, all I see is issues and they don't see the opportunity anymore. Then they have that valley of despair. So like you went through that valley of despair with the cold calling and you're like, there has to be another way to do this, to attract clients instead of me always constantly have to grind and find them. So now you're in the social media space and you're creating the content. So you're being a content creator almost that uh, you are. At what point in time, because obviously it didn't click almost immediately or correct me if I'm wrong, but at what point in time did you start seeing an upswing and you're like, oh my God, there is actually something tangible here? It was probably closer to, let's say the six month mark. And this is something that I, I tell everyone, right? No matter what platform you're getting onto, you're not going to put out a video and instantly like someone's going to call you most of the time, right? You shouldn't have that expectation. So the way I always talk about it, they say, you have to have an aggressive patience. And what I mean by that is you want to aggressively do the things that you have control over on a daily basis, but don't expect the results to come right away, mm. right? Be patient with that because it could be three months, six months, 12 months, but what do you have control over? Okay, if I'm going to set a goal to put out three videos a week, then do that. Maybe you can increase it, right? But just don't always focus on the outcome. Like, of course that's important at the end of the day but you could be doing everything perfectly and as you guys know you go through a, a transaction as smoothly as possible and something that you have no control over could kill it at the end of the day but does that mean 
that you weren't successful or you didn't do a good job, right? I would, I'd say no. Yeah. So it's about consistency. Yeah. Who did we have on the other day? They were like, you know, going to the gym for an hour. You know, when you first get back to the gym, you go for an hour. At the end of the, uh, at the end of the workout, you're upset that you don't have a six pack yet. Right. It's consistency, right? You're losing weight over time. You're building muscle over time. It's, it's the, it's the result of these consistent behaviors. So no, I could see that a hundred percent people, but that's the same thing as, you know, uh, uh, another prospecting avenue, right? Like when somebody first sits down to call for sale by owners, they get upset if the first for sale by owner lists with another agent yeah. or doesn't list with them, right? So I think the tough part with this business is people, you know, what's based on what they see on TV or, or what they see on social, they ex- expect like instant gratification and instant success. Yeah. And what they don't realize is like how much grinding goes on behind the scenes and how much, you know, you have to do it. And, and I think a question you probably get all the time is like, which specific Instagram post or social or social post or YouTube video, you know, has gotten you the most amount of clients? And, and I imagine the answer is that it's not one specific one. It's your consistent posting. But the, the one thing to keep in mind, though, is the target market, because now you're in real. So there's two different kind of approaches that you have. And I think that the mistake and we make this all the time. I was literally talking to Kim about it the other day, other day too. Um, it's like, you whatever you want to be known for you should be focused on that target do you agree with that statement 100 yeah. percent. and i think you can even change that based on your platform so i know a lot of guys who are using linkedin as more of a agent focused platform versus youtube for instance where they're trying to attract more clients and like the other thing is and if you talk to for instance, guys like Tom Story, again, as an example, his Instagram is primarily referrals from other agents. So even though he doesn't have the same attraction potential as EXP or real, he's been using it as more of a source of other agents referring him business, which has been a major source for him. And now he's focused his efforts there. Whereas personally, I'm using my platforms, right? I've made separate accounts for more of the attraction side yeah. versus my primary accounts are more so consumer focused. That's super important. And it's uh, sometimes it can get very hairy in between because something that you might be passionate about is like with everything that's going on with AI right now, I go crazy over it and I'm like, this is really cool. This is like, this is some fun shit. Like I want to like talk about this, whatever the case it is, but it has nothing to do with real estate. And then well, when yeah. I'll be like, hey, like we should do this. And she'll like, Kim will be like, no, that's that's not. Like you told me this is the concept that you wanted to portray. Like this is how it needs to be. And I'm like, but I like it <laughs> and I can't change it. But it's it's just different things. Um, now, I know Tom's story was nice enough to share with us like his in-depth strategies on YouTube. Like YouTube for him is like a big converter. And I think that we calculated how much, I think it averaged out to like, and I could be completely wrong. So Tom, if you listen to this, I'm sorry. It was like $5,000 per video is what the compensation was uh, essentially. And he had like a call to action where it's like, hey, if you wanna have a conversation with me, click on the Calendly a good time to talk, whatever the case it is. Are you copying that model as well? More or less, yes. The only difference, I think, as I kind of mentioned, is that his is more generalized real estate market, yeah, and potentially. Is. And I don't mean generalized. I mean, he's focused on Toronto. Agent to agent um, as well. Yeah, but mine is more so actually like community, like very community focused, more community tours versus yeah. he's more talking about the market. I do a bit of both, but I've just found personally that this way has worked better for me. Yeah. Again, kind of like Levi does, right? Yeah. But yeah, same thing, call to action. Like my biggest thing is just try to get them to book a call. Yeah. So I think with most people, if we can get somebody on a call with us, I have the confidence that I'm going to turn them into a client. Yeah. Right? So the I went through all of passive prospecting. So another shout out to Levi Lessig. He has a lot of great things and he talks about the community tours and he talks about like how that's actually what people want. Like when you look at the search volumes, that's exactly what they want. So you're giving them exactly what they want. When you're creating those, or let me start off with how long have you been working on that YouTube channel for the community um, like tours? So that's almost a year and a half now. Okay. So, and yeah, def- YouTube's definitely like, a, it's, a, it's the toughest one out there without a doubt. Yeah. And you talk to any of these guys who are doing a really good job at it, aside from maybe Levi. And it's, you know, for the first six months, you feel like you're talking to a brick wall. Yeah. And then there's something that kind of just switches and all of a sudden now you've got these inbound leads and it's it's building on top of each other as well yeah right with with the other platforms videos kind of just die off maybe a couple days a week whatever that is whereas my most viewed video was actually one of my first ever and it continues to grow and get more views 
That's awesome. Yeah, that's so true. YouTube is a search engine, so no well, matter searchable, what. searchable, yeah. Yeah, as long as it's like SEO optimized, and Levi goes in that in his book, like crazy how to do that and those resources there. And it made me feel very ignorant because when we started this podcast, we had no idea how to like operate or optimize. I thought it was just someplace you throw it and then it just does what it does. But there's so much on the back end that goes on there. I know in Levi in his book, he talks about, uh, for him, it was roughly like a number of weeks before he got his first uh, deal that came in. And then when they opened up their Houston office, it took like two weeks before they got their first inbound buyer lead. Um, and that was from the, like the weekly. And you're saying it took six months for you to get your first one to come in. I definitely had a few in, in the meantime, but I mean yeah. more consistently. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I, I can't remember the exact time frame. Like it was definitely in the first two or three months that I had my first inbound lead. Yeah. But until I consistently would, you know, be waking up every single week and, you know, having an appointment or two booked. Yeah. That was closer to six to nine months, I would say. Yeah, sure. So when you were doing those, the six to nine months when you were working on the videos that you're putting up and everything in there, were you doing like A-B tests? Were you testing out what was working, what wasn't working? Any tips for someone to avoid? To an extent, but it was more smaller things within the video because I think there's kind of four or five videos that, as I say, have been kind of tried and true across yeah. North America. And it's like top five neighborhoods, worst five neighborhoods, pros and cons of yep. cost of living in this city and then five reasons to move to or reasons why not to move to. Yeah. I think it, you can apply those to essentially any market. And even if there's already people doing those videos in that market, someone's going to connect better with you than another person, which is another thing that I don't know if enough people talk about. Cause you go on there and you see, Oh my God, well, you know, Alex is already doing it and he's already got however many subscribers. Like, why would I want to do it? It's like, well, how many real estate agents are there in your market? How many people are knocking on doors, knocking on expires? Does that stop you from doing those things? Yeah. Right. No. So why would one, two, three, ten other agents on YouTube, why would that stop you? Yeah. Right. I did initially get in because there was literally nobody or very few people doing it. I saw a huge opportunity. I know there's many more in other markets that are, but don't let that stop you. I think YouTube's definitely the most underutilized platform by realtors and i think that's where the biggest opportunity is right now yeah. and well video content in general that's actually like entertaining and informative at the same time is a rarity so either you're doing walkthroughs of a house and you're like this is my new listing but it's not informative or it's just like well it's more ego based yeah or it's going to be like, like people, the three people, ways people want to make those value. videos because they want to like tell other realtors like oh i got this listing or they want to build themselves up for credibility rather than you know i think if I were to go heavy into to video for like building my personal brand, I think you have to ask yourself, am I creating this video that I'm about to film today, right? So that I can add value to my clients mm -hmm. or build relationships or, or maintain relationships with current clients? Or am I doing this to, you know, tell you how great I am at, at uh, taking listings? Yeah, that's true. But the biggest thing too is like a lot of salespeople are introverts and they don't want to talk to the masses at the same time but you were able to overcome that. Any tips on that? Yeah, I don't know what it is. Just talking into a camera for me is a lot easier than putting me in front of a stage of 25 people. Like public speaking is literally my biggest fear, but I did want to be able to reach the masses because I personally work better on a one-to-one -one basis. So mm -hmm. I think it's just given me that opportunity. It's, de it's definitely not going to be easy to start. Like you're going to be just thinking about what other, like the biggest thing is like people don't care about you, like in the nicest way possible, right? Like the way I like to put it is even if you followed me for years, you probably couldn't tell me what I posted three days ago, right? Mm -hmm. And if you don't like something, we're so quick to just swipe away or move on to the next thing. People aren't sitting there like looking at you, criticizing you, saying how stupid you look like they they're so caught up in their own minds and their own lives that they just really don't care, right? We, it's just I think it's the human condition. I saw a Mel Robbins quote this morning. I don't know if I can share this. It says, if you wouldn't trade your life with the person who is criticizing you, why on earth do you care what they think? Yeah. And I think that's so true because there's so many people, like especially people, and I can think of a few agents on our team that are hesitant to do, you know, to create content because they're just like, oh, like I'm, they're worried about like whether people think or maybe they're even just worried about like what they think, right? They're like, yeah. you know, I'm not very good at this or you know, what do my friends think? I know like I, my friends would bust my chops all the time when I first started putting out video and, and stuff. And they're like, oh man, no one cares. Another video, like, you know, and they, everybody will bust your chops, but you know, you have to do it. 
and you have to be consistent and you have to just not not give a shit what other people think yeah and you have to also like i've said this a hundred times on here is that you have you just have to not care if it sucks because you know it's going to suck right alex if we go back yeah. to the bottom of your page your first few videos they sucked right 100 percent. he's like agree you better agree it sucked. No. no it's and, true and so like on that note right um I always tell people like, don't compare your chapter one to someone else's chapter 20, yeah. right? I wouldn't be able to get to where I am today if I hadn't started at chapter one. And I give this presentation a lot and I show people what that first video was like and it was awful, it was terrible. I've definitely gotten a lot better. I still have a long ways to go, but I'm, I'm not perfect by any means. And just touching on the previous thing you were talking about, I actually wanted to mention another way to kind of get over that fear is it was something that Gary Vee said, whether you like him or not, it stuck with me for a long period of time, but in general, most people who are doing better than you aren't going to try and bring you down. And so essentially it's like what those people are doing is they're projecting their own insecurities or traumas onto you because it's an ego based thing, right? If how can I bring them down to make myself feel better? But if I was to ask you, are you a purple unicorn? Or if I call it, sorry, if I was to call you a purple unicorn, would you be upset? No, no, no. Right. But if I was to, you know, say that you're an awful real estate agent or something along these lines, like the big, at at the end of the day, what I'm trying to get across is that if there is any self doubt or something else, maybe that's something you have to explore, but why should I get upset about something that you say about me? If I genuinely know deep down that it's not true. Yeah. 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 Another way to say that is like the only people that will comment or criticize or, or make comments is, is people that are usually doing less than you. Yeah, we'll so, criticize. Yeah, no, you're never going to criticize somebody on top of you. So it's always going to come from somebody below. You. One of the things I've been doing as I'm reading Levi's book, I've been going through a lot of our YouTube, like the studio in the back end, and I read a lot of the comments when I'm bored, right? So like, I'll be home looking at the comments and the amount of interesting, like you'll get some negative things and well, a lot of negative things in there. And it's just, it's actually like, it's hilarious because I'm just like, I'll sit there and be like, damn, I wish, I wish there was more of these because like some people are really, really funny. And then I was thinking about it. I was like, I wonder if people actually get hurt by this because like some people will be on social media and they'll be like, people are really mean. But I, I feel think like when you have thick skin from like, like when you're prospecting so much and you're getting cursed out maybe once a week and you're dealing with certain things, and then it's like, it, it nothing compares after that. It's like you develop such crazy thick skin after yeah. being in sales and then feeling like you're a little bit more rejection proof in that certain element. Well, I think that's what Alex said before. It was like, you were happy that you started by making calls or, or cold calling or, or door knocking or, or whatnot, just because it, it got you more comfortable talking to people and being in those positions. But it also helps with rejection, like, like 100%. as well. Yeah, without a doubt. And uh, on the note about the mean comments, I used to do a mean comment Monday and I would throw it up on my Instagram story because the, the worst platforms without a doubt are TikTok, Twitter, and then YouTube's kind of in there, but I mean like TikToks, anything where people don't have a face on the other side and they just have these like blank profiles, like, they are ruthless, but I think it's hilarious. I just kind of laugh and like create more content out of it. And then I think that just shows like that you have confidence and like it doesn't get to you or bother you. Plus you got to think about the other side, like more comments means it's boosting the algorithm and then it's going to more people. So who cares? Yeah. I should keep wearing those turtlenecks. I'm telling you. Kiro hasn't worn a turtleneck since somebody commented on one of our uh, videos that he looked like Colonel Mustard. No, because he was laughing at it. And then one of the, one of the, <laughs> one of the agents uh, comes up to me. She's like, by the way, like you don't wear a light turtleneck with a suit jacket. Like that's just not a no, it's like a no-go. I'm like, well, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> this, I wore this like dude's a single. Of, <laughs> he's single, he's going out. He doesn't have time to go to the dry cleaner. You were just wearing turtlenecks because you were out of shirts. Yeah, exactly. But then the problem is I bought all light colored turtlenecks. So then I look like a dummy. For well, the like, problem was you bought multiple turtlenecks. Yeah, and that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I like those. Whatever. One of the quotes that hit me the hardest was actually one that we heard yesterday. And it was like, it resonated so much. It, long story short, it says people tippy toe through life with caution and then they go to their grave, right? Instead of taking like bold movements and like, you know, taking risks and taking ownership of that step that they're moving forward and they're always just tippy toeing in caution. Um, and on social media, it's the same thing. It's like, what are they going to think? One thought that comes to mind is whether it does or whether it doesn't, it's a legacy that lives on for your lineage or for your your family, right? So wouldn't you want your, at least your great, great, great grandkids to be able to reference it one day and be like, oh yeah, he was actually a pretty cool dude. Yeah. Right. So if anything, if it fails, at least it's like a archive for your family, which is the only thing that matters at the end of the day when you zero in on everything else, right? So like, if you care so much about what other people think, then you're really just taking away, you're robbing your family of the opportunity to actually get to know who the true you is from being bold. So be bold.
That was deep. It was a good realization. I like that. That was good. In, in closing, just because I'm aware of our time here, Alex, you had um, a post about visibility beats ability. And I think that's great for people who... I, I've been told that Tom's story started that one. I actually asked him about it. So we're going to give Tom credit. Oh, uh, yes. We've got, I mean, this is like... A, we've given Tom a lot of credit here. Um, but he's, he's great at what he does. So he, he's, he's, he is worthy of the credit. Visibility beats ability. Talk to us a little bit about that because I think that's great for some newer agents who you know, maybe aren't that comfortable with their skills yet. Yeah. So, I mean, at the end of the day, it really just boils down to, it doesn't matter if you're the best real estate agent in the room. If you don't give yourself the opportunity to get in front of somebody, you can't turn them into a client. So again, even if you're better than me, if I get the opportunity to sit down at the table with them, you never even got that opportunity. So how do you turn them into a client? And the other side of that, I'm sure you've heard it multiple times in in sales is that by not if you think you are better than other people, right, it's actually a disservice not to tell them to use your services. Of course, at the end of the day, you have to have the ability to back it up, but to get exposure, to get in front of more people, like it just comes down to. It's like it, success is my duty. It, it almost like if you think you're capable, if you can, then you must, right? If you can do the greatest job for them, then you must do it for them because that's your duty, right? If you know that it's possible to do a better job than someone else, then you're responsible if they get shitty service for not actually having them know your name. Our coach used to give us an analogy. I used to say, you could be the most skilled agent, but when you drive by that for sale by owner sign, your chances of getting it is zero out of zero, right? It's like 100% you're not gonna get it. But if you have no skill in the world, but you take the action and you go outside and knock on the door, your probability of getting the listing is significantly higher than the person that's super skilled, but doesn't take the first step to do so. Yeah. So taking that first step over and over again, and not being committed to the outcomes like you said earlier, and then being committed to the actual process of being like, all right, I know this works, it's a proven process because you reference to it as like, this has been tried and true in North America, so I know it works, so I'm gonna go into it. So whether it takes, you did it for six months consistently, so you, to, to get bits and pieces in there and to keep going consistent, it takes a lot of dedication knowing that it works. So we commend you for that. What's one thing you can leave some agents, like one tip in general that they should be doing uh, any advice don't try to copy everybody else just figure out what works for you like you can be inspired by others but just because someone tells you that you have to get on social media you have to call a call or you have to door knock like i think that's the beauty of this business is that you can do it any way that you want to so if you're going to get on a social media platform don't spread yourself too thin to start choose one dedicate yourself just become obsessive and really just figure out the intricacies of that before you try to be everywhere so that's what I did when I started and I kind of took one platform per year to really learn it without yeah. spreading myself too thin. So just dedicate yourself to one of those prior to trying to be everywhere. Sweet. What does it say about realtors that it's funny, like when, when a new licensee just gets their, when somebody just gets their license, I feel like the first thing they do is go on and make John realtor Instagram. Right. Yeah. But what does that tell you about people? They see us realtors just on Instagram doing stupid shit. And they're like, oh, well, that's, that's what you must have to do when you get your license. You don't make twerking videos making fun of sellers the whole time? It's just, <laughs> it's absurd. But, it's like, it, but then you wonder why there's so many shitty agents out there that act like, you know, whatever. But. There's there's what you see and there's what's true. That's for sure. You can yeah. either worry about them or you can worry about you. And finding out the resources like you have is definitely the biggest thing. And I think finding your own voice, like you were saying, is the biggest thing because you could do it in so many different ways but yeah. the way that you do it is going to be unique and that's what people are going to like or not like and i wouldn't be discouraged if someone else is doing it in your marketplace because they might click with you more than anybody else yeah well it shows so. your it gives you a leg up right if somebody's if somebody's interviewing you and you're going to go on a listing appointment at their house at two o'clock and you know a couple out that, that morning they were looking at your youtube channel they already know like if i know that alex dunbar is coming over to do a listing presentation at my house i can tell you like just based on your appearance you're professional, you're serious, you're numbers driven, you know, and I've already got a good feeling of who I'm meeting with. Yeah. I mean, it just do it for that, those reasons right there. Yeah. Tom was the first person that I asked in the social media platform or like just the video content world. I was like, so how does it like work? Like what's your percentage of like rejection, this and the other? He's like, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm like, well, how often do like the people call you? And then it's like, you can't book the appointment or whatever. He's like, I don't get the question. He's like, people 
watch the content. They know me. They like me. They trust me because they feel like they already know who I am from the content. Yeah. So and then their conversion is much higher. Yeah. So he's like, they just they want to meet with me. That's all it is. Like they want to meet with me. I go meet with them. It's they're ready then or they're ready in the future. Yeah. That's and I kind of mentioned it before too. It's like the people they've already qualified you. Yeah. And that's the beauty of being on video, right? Like they're almost like, hey, will you work with me? Do you have time? Right. Can you take on more clients? I've well, been it's a whole you for- it's a whole mental shift. Yeah. You're shifting everything. It's like, you know, Alex, do you have time to work with us? Because we can see how busy you are, right? Like, can you fit us into your schedule rather than us saying like, please give me the listing. And, but then keep in mind, I think if there's things on your channel that people don't like, they're probably disqualifying you and you don't even know it, right? So you don't even have a chance to meet with them. And you you have to win them all. You have to be okay with that. Yeah, exactly. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, I think people are scared of scaring people away. But if we weren't going to be a good fit anyways, I don't You know, I probably don't want to work with you. And, and just on that note is, but uh, oh, I had something really good that I wanted to say. Was it about qualifying, disqualifying, working with the people you want to work with? Yeah. Oh, that's what it was. Okay. So I actually recently have, in terms of like video, I actually think video leads are better than referrals. And the reason for this is I've never had somebody call me through a video that was interviewing other agents. But typically when I get a referral, like, don't get me wrong, referrals are incredible business. But a lot of time it's like, hey, we referred to you, but we're going to interview two other people. Yeah. When it's through video, it's like, hey, Alex, we've been watching for 12 months. Like, you're the guy we want to work with. Yeah. Yeah. Remember, like, these videos that we all put out, days on market, absorption rate, the boring stuff, the community stuff. You're just, like, fighting for that mental bandwidth in somebody's head. And they may not need you today, but when they're ready, you're the choice because you've got their that mind space. Yeah. Right? It's the same reason back... You know, when we would prospect our database, we're leaving a voicemail for people every three months. Hey, Alex, just checking in. Want to give you a quick update on the market when you're ready. And they don't call you back because they don't need you that yeah. minute. But when they're ready, you have fought hard to stay on the top of mind. Yeah. So it's yeah. just planting those seeds. Absolutely right. All right. Yeah. Alex. Sorry. I, I remembered what I was going to say. I hit, the, no, I hit, hit leave it. The one last thing is that the biggest thing as well is you have to be authentic and genuine. Right. Because if, if you go into someone's house or you meet with them and you're not the same person that you are on video, trust is gone. Yeah. Right. So that's don't true. try to be somebody who you're not like, just be who you are, because that's the best part. Because as you've already mentioned, when they meet you, they're like, we already feel like we know you. So you better be the same person you are on one side of the camera as you are that you're actually in person. Yeah. I can imagine someone like reaching out on a dancing TikTok video and they're like, what? Dance. Dance. <laughs> like, why are you not dancing? <laughs> You're not the same. Dance. This has been awesome. Alex, thank you for sharing the uh, this insight. It's super helpful. What's the best way for someone to reach out if they want to collaborate, send a referral, or just ask any questions? I'm happy to share my contact information. So, I mean, I'll give my number. I'm not too worried. Uh, 604-314-5418. Uh, you can reach me on my email, alex at realestatehelp.com, or Instagram is also a great source, Alex R. Dunbar. Those are probably the three best to reach me at. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having me on, guys.